comic weekly man, the jolly comic weekly man. And I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time. And here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, 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 hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just wonderful because this is one of my favorite times. Oh, I know what you mean. This is Easter. Yes. I just love Easter because then I have a wonderful time looking for Easter eggs in the morning. And did the bunny leave you lots of eggs this year? Yes, he left me lots of chicken eggs. The bunny left you chicken eggs? Well, they tasted like chicken when I ate them. Uh, a chicken or chicken eggs? Like eggs. Oh, yes. Well, that's the wonderful thing about bunnies. On Easter morning, they always make the eggs taste like chicken eggs. Uh, that's one of their tricks. Oh. Were they very pretty eggs? Oh, yes. They were all different colors, and some of them had stripes, and some of them had stars on them. Oh, the ones with stars were laid by the bunny who was good in school. <laughs> I'll bet it was. Mm -hmm. And now, I hope you can read me the funnies and read about Br'er Rabbit, because he's one of my favorites, too. Puck the Comic Weekly? Mm -hmm. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, here's Hopalong Cassidy. Oh, and I'm anxious to find out what happened to Hoppy and, and Philippi, that boy he was helping. Well, let's read now and find out. So here we go with Hopalong Cassidy on page one. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hopalong. <laughs> California and Lucky have been captured by the sheriff's posse. And first picture, Lucky, who is in a cell at the jail, is saying to the deputy, We didn't kidnap Don Felipe. Turn us loose. Second picture, California says, Yeah, wait till Hopalong Cassidy hears of this. The deputy just sneers and says, Yeah, he will soon. I reckon as how Sheriff Meggs and the posse have caught up with him by now. <laughs> Meanwhile, Hoppy has taken Felipe home to his father's ranch. The sheriff, led by Sloat and his men, followed Hoppy there. And last picture, second row, the sheriff is saying to Hoppy, You outsmarted yourself, Cassidy. Seeing the law closing in, you beat us here to Don Raymond's with a twisted yarn of how you saved young Felipe from kidnappers. And Felipe's father, Don Raymond, says, Oh, gracias, sheriff, for arresting this, this, this fraud. First picture, next row, the sheriff says, Well, you can thank Sloat here for warning me in time. The town jail won't seem so lonesome now with Cassidy and his pards as guests. Sloat snarls. Let's get started, Sheriff. And the men mount, and as they gallop off, Sloat says to the Sheriff, I'd lay odds that Cassidy and those two galoots are behind all the recent raids on Don Raymond's hacienda. The Sheriff replies, Well, if so, you've done Rio Vista a big favor, Sloat. At this point, Sloat and his outlaws bid farewell to the sheriff, who gallops off. First picture, next row. Sloat sends his men back to the shack. And first picture, next row. He takes a deserted road, back trail, for the town of Rio Vista, so he won't be seen by the sheriff. First picture, bottom row, Sloat's in the local tax collector's office and is reporting to an oily-looking man sitting behind a desk. And the sheriff's holding three strangers for trial of kidnapping Don Felipe Madeira. The man sits back in his chair, smiles smugly, and says, last picture, Well, I'd hate to be in their boots if an unruly mob decided not to wait for a trial. Sloat smiles evilly, saying, Yeah. That's what I've been thinking. Oh, what does he mean by that? I think he's trying to get Sloat to rouse the citizens against Hoppy and his pals so they'll break open the jail and take Hoppy out and lynch him. Oh, my goodness, that's against the law. I know, but some mean people often do that. That's terrible. I wonder what's going to happen. Well, maybe something will come up. So let's wait till next week to find All out. All right. Now? Is the Prince Valiant on page three again? Well, let's turn over the page and see. All right. Yes, there he is. And he 
he's still on the mountain being chased by those savage men. Yes, he'd gone to the mountain to hunt chamois skins so the monks in the monastery would have warm clothes. And, and just as he was going back, all loaded down with lots of skins, he was attacked by the savage men that you called the uh, bar, bar, bar... That's bar right, the barbarians. Yes, that's what I said. But Val got away from them by climbing a mountain ridge over their heads. And so, please read. I'm anxious to see if he gets away all right. All right, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Gray, Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> The barbarians shoot at Val, who climbs the ridge above them, beyond range of their arrows, as he seeks a way to get above and around them. But last picture, his plight is desperate. Night is falling, and his clothing is soaked with melting snow. But at last, first picture, next row, Val sees a wide ledge. But can he safely cross the snow slope between? Between the two rocks lies a space of about ten feet of snow that's frozen hard. Val wonders if it's strong enough to hold him. If it doesn't... He'll fall to the rocks a hundred feet below. But behind him are the barbarians. Val has no choice. Last picture of the row. Cautiously he starts, fearful of starting an avalanche. A few feet from his goal, the slope gives a sickening lurch. And Val leaps for the ledge. And he's not a second too soon, for a dark crevasse appears and widens, and then the snow falls away. Val, safe on the rock, knows there can be no return. Then swiftly night falls, and Val realizes he'll freeze if he doesn't do something quickly. So second picture, bottom row, he dances about to send the blood circulating and warm his chill body. Then, thoroughly warm, he removes his clothing and wrings the damp clothes as dry as possible. Then, after dressing again, he makes out with a cheery, chilly meal from one of the chamois which he'd been carrying. Then, he digs a cave in the snow and wraps himself up in the damp chamois hides. And here, sheltered from the winter wind, he snuggles in and hopes to survive the cold, cold night. <laughs> cold place to spend the night? That wind whistling makes me cold just to hear it. Yes. Well, I hope the hides of the chamois keep him warm enough to stay alive and safe through the night. I hope so, too. Well, we'll learn more about this next week. Now, how would you... Oh, uh... I'd just love to if it's Br'er Rabbit. Well, since you're so anxious <laughs> to read Br'er Rabbit, let's turn over the page and go past Jungle Jim. Turn over another page, and there on page seven is Uncle Remus and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, make, make it a habit, habit to give us music for old Brown Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, The trouble with Brown Fox is he thinks about everybody too much. Yeah, <laughs> especially about Brown Rabbit. The Brown Sparrow flies to Brown Rabbit. And he says excitedly, Hey, 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 I just see Br'er Fox building a trap. And Br'er Rabbit says, Hmm, oh, it couldn't be for anyone else but me. Well, come on, come on. And Br'er Swallow leads Br'er Rabbit off to where Br'er Fox is building the trap. Br'er Rabbit hides behind a big rock, and he sees Br'er Fox weaving a trap out of willow wands. And Br'er Fox is singing, Rabbit stew, I love you. And Br'er Rabbit sees Br'er Fox tying a rope to the top of the tree. And he throws the rope over the top of a limb. And pulls the trap up over the limb of the tree. And then he ties the other end of the rope to a little stake he's driven in the ground. And Br'er Fox says, <laughs> This is the best ungetting out of trap I has ever built. Last picture top row, Br'er Fox turns to a basket of asparagus, saying, And sparagrass for bait. <laughs> Rabbit is suckers for asparagus. And he begins to stick the asparagus in the ground underneath the trap. And Br'er Fox says, first picture bottom row, Br'er Rabbit is going to get all the asparagus he wants, and then I is going to get all the rabbit that 
I was. <laughs> Brer Rabbit has ideas, too. He takes his slingshot out of his pocket, takes careful aim at the stake at the end of the rope, and then lets fly. The stone knocks the stake loose, releasing the trap. It falls, trapping Brer Fox. And last picture, he howls, Oh, let me out! Burr, burr. And Brer Rabbit throws him a handful of asparagus. As Brer Sparrow says, <laughs> Brer Fox is going to get mighty sick of living on asparagus. And Brer Rabbit giggles, Well, it's better for him than rabbits do. And Uncle Remus says, A real friend is the one what gets there ahead of the need. Wow, <laughs> that bear fox deserved just what he got. The very idea, trying to, to set a trap for a nice little rabbit like Brer Rabbit so he could make rabbit stew out of it. Yes, well, it often happens that when you try to do dirt to the other fellow, the dirt comes right back in your own face. Yes, and I'm glad it happened to Brer Fox. It served him right. It certainly did. And now let's turn over to the last page of the first section and see what's there. Oh, it's Flash Gordon, and I'm anxious to read that because Flash is in a new rocket ship that he made, and he's trying to get back down to Earth. And just as he was nearing Earth, a meteor, which is a falling star, came toward them. And, and Flash had to turn aside so they wouldn't be hit, but then he couldn't control the rocket ship, and I'm anxious to know if they'll be able to get back down to the Earth. Well, let's find out right now. So here we go with Flash Gordon. riga riga doon doon Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash's rocket is heating up like a shooting star in Earth's outer air. And Flash says to Dale, Our brake rockets won't hold. We've got to turn around and use our tail rockets to slow us down. <laughs> Turning his rocket around end for end with a gyroscope, Flash brakes with swiftly increasing power as he plunges toward Earth not far from New York. Land-based jets leap up to check on the strange visitor from space. Closer and closer he falls to Earth. And as he comes spinning backward to the ground, last picture, top row, he almost checks his fall. But the rocket lands heavily on its tail end and topples to Earth, shaking up its two passengers. There was wild excitement in the countryside because Flash has landed in a small community in the park. Naturally, the people there are completely amazed to see this unusual rocket ship coming to Earth in such a strange manner. And in no time, there was a small crowd gathered around the rocket ship. First picture, bottom row, Flash opens the hatch to his ship. And he hears the man asks, are they men from Mars? Hey, look, one's a girl. An officer reaches for his gun. Flash waves good-naturedly and says, Hey, don't shoot, officer. We've just come home from a long trip. When the people on Earth learn it's Flash Gordon and Dale who have landed, there's a great celebration. And before they know it, they're receiving a record-breaking reception as the first persons who ever traveled in space. A big parade is held in Flash and Dale's honor, and they're taken on a tour of the city. Down Broadway they go, sitting on the top of their car as thousands cheer. The photographers take pictures, and Dale is so happy, and Flash smiles at her. Well, we're really home. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I'm so glad Flash landed safely, and people treated Flash just like a hero. So am I. I'm glad they have sense enough to know he's a hero. I wonder what'll happen next week. Well, if I know Flash Gordon, I wouldn't be surprised if a new adventure started. Well, now would you read me Dagwood and Blondie? They're next on the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. All right, I'll read them in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood, I'm going to the beauty parlor, and I'll be back in an hour. Dagwood calls to Blondie. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Cash this check for me at the bank on your way. I need some money. I'm broke. A little later, a delivery boy is at the door. Last picture, top row, saying to Dagwood, A package for Mrs. Bumstead. $22. Collect. Dagwood exclaims, Oh, boy, I haven't a cent until Blondie returns. 
And this is her dress for the party tonight. Dagwood tells the delivery boy to wait a minute. He dashes over to Herb Woodley's house. He asked Herb for his picture next row. Hey, Herb, will you please lend me $22 for one hour? Once again, Herb sees a chance to make some money out of Dagwood, and he says, uh, what will you put up for security? Dagwood drops to his knees, and he says, you can hold me for an hour. I'll put myself up for security. Herb puffs on his pipe. And then says, okay, that's a deal. So he hands Dagwood the money. Dagwood dashes back to the delivery boy. And last picture the row says, here's your $22 for the dress. And Herb takes Dagwood by the hand saying, now come on. Remember, you belong to me, body and soul, for one hour. <laughs> and back to Herb's house they go. First picture next row, Dagwood is sitting in the corner, bound hand and foot, as Herb sits at a desk, figuring out how much money he's going to make for loaning Dagwood the $22. And Herb says, the interest on the loan will be 3% for the first hour and 6 for each additional hour. <laughs> Dagwood snorts, some fine friend. <laughs> Meanwhile, Blondie is downtown at the beauty parlor. And the sales girl says to her, And hey, why don't you let me give you a poem in it, Mrs. Bumstead? It'll just take a few hours longer. And Blondie replies, Okay, Sally, I have plenty of time. Last picture of the row, Herb says gleefully, <laughs> The interest is piling up. It's almost three hours. <laughs> just then the doorbell rings. And he goes to the door, and first picture bottom row finds Blondie there. She says, Herbert, Dagwood's not home. You know where he is? Sure. I've got him locked up in our clothes closet. And he leads her back to the house. And he opens the closet door. And Dagwood falls out. When Blondie sees Dagwood bound hand and foot, her hat pops off in surprise. And Herb chuckles devilishly. You can have him back for $25.30. <laughs> Naturally, Blondie gives Herb the Dagwood, uh, give the money. And as she carries Dagwood home, last picture. Herb counts his money, saying, Personally, I wouldn't have paid that much to get him back. And Blondie answers angrily. Well, after all, he's my husband. Oh, that Herb. Isn't he a wicked man to treat Dagwood like that? Oh, I wouldn't be too worried. This is only a funny story, especially for the funny papers. Oh, oh, that's right. But, but don't they do the funniest things? Yes, they do. Oh, look, right underneath Blondie, there's Roy Rogers. And I'll read that right now. So here we go on page one of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly with Roy Rogers. Say the magic words with me. I yip, yip by yo. Now, now here we go, we go with Roy, Roy and Trigger. I yip, yip by yo. <laughs> it's a day of the Wild West show. As Roy and Dangerfield enter the ring, the escaped convict, Handles Baldwin, disguised as a cowboy, turns a wild bull loose. Roy sees the bull coming at him and yells to Dangerfield, Hey, jump to one side. He'll gore you. Try to keep moving. I've got an idea. Dangerfield jumps aside not a second too soon. Roy quickly pulls his revolver and... With one shot, cuts a rope holding a red banner on a pole. The banner falls to the ground. And as Dangerfield comes running by, last picture top row, Roy yells, Keep running, he's headed in the right direction. And Roy whips the banner across the bull's eyes. The bull trips and falls to the ground. First picture, bottom row. Hey, yippee, Roy Rogers snagged the bull. Roy and Dangerfield are safe. Handles Baldwin, who is watching from behind a pillar, growls, Ah, dread it. My scheme to fix Rogers and that showman Dangerfield backfired. But I ain't finished yet. At that moment, one of the men standing nearby sees Baldwin and yells, Hey! There's that escaped jailbird! Handles Baldwin! Get him! Roy turns and hollers. 
You're not getting away this time, Baldwin. I aim to keep my promise and deliver you to the sheriff alive. And he runs for Baldwin, who, last picture, leaps in the saddle of a horse standing nearby. Now let go of that bridle. And a cowboy named Chet, holding the reins of the horse, says, Get off that horse! It's a wild run! Oh, goody, goody, goody. That's a good joke on Handel's Baldwin. I just hope that horse bucks him off. And then when he falls to the ground, I hope he bumps his head good and hard and, and he gets knocked subconscious. And then Roy will pick him up and put him in the ring and say, Sheriff, here's your man. Well, next week we'll find out. Now, oh, I think it's time for... Oh, um... oh, it's time for Dick's Adventures. We haven't read him yet, you know. Oh, yes. Dick's Adventures. So let's turn over to the very last page. And here he is. Dick is with Mad Anthony Wayne and General Washington, and there's been a big battle between the English and the Americans, but the Americans lost. Yes, the armies retreated before the overwhelming force of the British. I wonder what's going to happen to Dick now. Well, let's read and find out. So here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. Riggedy pack, kazak, kazik. That's that music for adventurous Dick. Dick and his disheartened brothers in arms retreat before the overpowering British and Hessians driving on Philadelphia. It's a disastrous end to the Battle of Brandywine Creek, the year 1776. In the enveloping darkness and fog, Dick is cut off from his friends, the foes all around him. Last picture, top row, Dick finds himself alone in the underbrush, hearing movements in the dark about him. As he sits there quietly, he says to himself unhappily, Gee, they're whipping us like dogs, and we're going to fight back like wolves. First picture, next row, a thought comes to him, and he says, Hey, what about our Navy? Didn't we have a Navy in the Revolutionary War? Hey, what about John Paul Jones? The next instant, Dick finds himself on board an old-time armed vessel, fast and small, flying the American flag. This is the Ranger, now on the high seas, 3,000 miles from home. Dick shakes his head and looks around, just as the sailor, last picture of the row, says to him, Skipper's been yelling for you, sir. Dick asked in surprise. Skipper? John Paul Jones? And he heads for the cabin. First picture, bottom row, Dick faces a handsome young man who is seated at a desk. This is Captain John Paul Jones, one of the most famous sea captains in American history. Jones says, I want you to take the next watch of the master, Dick. Keep your eyes peeled for British ships. We're nearing that coast. Aye, aye, sir. Last picture, Dick is climbing up the masthead to take his place at the watch, the very top of the forward mast, a pole in the ship's deck that holds up the sails. As he climbs higher and higher, he says, It's like climbing a wobbly ladder up the sky. Gee whiz, I better not tell anybody I never did this before. <laughs> It's dangerous for such a small boy to climb way up to the top of a mast of a ship in the wind when it's wiggling in the waves like that. Oh, you bet your life it is. You have to hang on tight. I don't think I'd like to do that. Oh, it's lots of fun once you get up there. Well, I'd rather stay on the ground and, and use a spyglass. Yes, you're much safer that way. Just think, Dick is with Captain John Paul Jones. He was really a very brave sailor, wasn't he? I should say so. And I think we're going to see some exciting adventures with John Paul Jones. Oh, goody. Oh, now, look, right underneath Dick's adventures, here's Rusty Riley. And this is getting very mysterious. Yes, a man named Smith has learned that Rusty bought the painting his landlady had sold. And at the airport, he discovered Tex is the man he's after. To keep his eye on Tex... He's asked Tex if he could ride to Kentucky with him in the truck. Well, I hope Tex doesn't let him ride along with him because you never can tell what'll happen. I don't trust this man. Well, let's find out now. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Tex says to the young man, well, I'd sure like to give you a ride, partner, but with a valuable horse aboard, I uh, just don't know. Smith replies, Sure, I understand, and I don't blame you, but I assure you I'm not a hoodlum. I'm an artist. Well, you sure don't look like the kind of hombre that would be boning a ride. Well, the fact is I'm temporarily out of funds, and, uh, well, I have to get to Lexington. Well, okay, mister, we'll take you along. You can call me Tex, Mrs. Rusty. 
What's your moniker? Oh, hello, Rusty. Uh, just call me Smitty. Well, I'm glad to know you, Smitty. Last picture of the road, Tex says, Hey, them fancy duds ain't exactly the best thing for riding the truck. I got an extra jacket in the back. Rusty will get it for you and hang your coat in the locker. What do you say? Smith takes off his coat saying, Thanks, very good idea. Very kind of you. First picture, bottom row. They're on their way. And Rusty is saying, Hey, do you say you're an artist, sir? Do you, do you paint pictures? For the magazines, maybe? Smith says hesitantly, Well, not exactly. I, uh, I'm really a draftsman. Mechanical, you know. Hours later, they're out in the country. Well along their way to Kentucky. Tech slows down, saying... Well, this is about as far as we can go for today. Uh, get Big Blaze out so we can stretch his legs, Rusty, while I fix us some chow. As Tex lets down the ramp on the back of the truck, Rusty hops in and pats Big Blaze, saying, Easy there, big boy. You're going out for a while. Hey, what's that envelope on the floor? Hm, that must have hopped out of, uh, dropped out of Smithy's coat when I hung it up. And he reaches down and he picks up the envelope. Last picture exclaims, Golly! This is an airplane ticket to Lexington. Gee, Willikins, why should he beg a ride with us when he could have flown? Oh, goody. Now we'll soon find out more about the mystery about what that painting's about. Yes. Well, Mr. Smith is going to be in an embarrassing spot when Tex asks him why he asked for a ride in the truck when he had that ticket in his pocket. <laughs> yes. My, I can hardly wait. Well, I'm afraid you'll have to wait, because that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right. Mr. Connie Bigley Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.